in the mountainous ranges of Morvan, southeast of Paris. The old woman with the snake's tongue tells her tale to all who had been intrigued. There was only so far that she could wander these days, and as such, she was being escorted to her birthplace, from which she had been exiled decades prior. For what? She asked the same. Her former liege, the king himself, had declared her mad for hearing his voice coming from beneath them. He had made his intentions clear then, and although she had not heard his voice since, in mutual silence, she and her followers awaited his motion. Together, they were simply waiting for the right moment. You're listening to episode 5 of Pulp, Surreal Stories from a Nearby Skull. An audio zine presented by the Sleepy Bones Detective Agency. The following broadcast is intended for mature audiences only. Look, you're gonna have to bear with me. We're going a little cosmic origin story here, but it is imperative that you understand the following. This reality is one of many, and they were all brought into existence by a conscious being racked with a boredom immemorial. Firstborn of all worlds, the Violet reality was picture perfect and fueled itself with the initial entity's endless omniscience. Very little happened, so the entity moved on. The Malachite reality was intentionally flawed and exhausted its natural resources before its only sentient inhabitants mastered interstellar travel. Replicating its original success was not a simple task. Apparently, even the Almighty had off days. It took experimentation and trial and error to forge a successful reality. The initial entity would take it a step at a time, bringing about a breathing ecosystem, tasting faintly of indigo. It was a simple design, relatively small and built from three universal plates. An eternal home, where the first beings would live their days as they willed it. A stationary storage space for the living fuel, and a filter between the two in order to sop up the unnecessary residues. In the latter, our tale continues. I've told you before, of course, that an overworked and underpaid union of labourers took care of the dilly-dallying of fuel from one realm to the other. I explained in detail how this process would strip them of their spiritual baggage and leave them a glowing, powerful essence. Not a single thought went towards what was left behind. All the bad vibes, the rotten memories, invisible trauma, unresolved catastrophes, unfulfilled desires, the anxieties of the human soul forming a world-rending stalagmite, a growing emotional tumour, which spread across the vast tilling of the empty. All of this would collect in the filter, at the mercy of its janitorial energies. If parts of this negative build-up were to break off and fall to the unexpectedly fertile soil of the empty, something would spread, a representation of their plane, a relic of humanity, some statue or a hut, a hint of mortality radiating a perseverance so grand that it could physically alter the environment around it. An increase in frequency, correlating to the preordained death rates. The ice-cold architecture evolved as their so-called spirit grew. As time progressed, and humankind began to record its own history, the empty runneth over with soiled structures, dashed dreams, and visions of the imagined. Unprecedented life would burst forth all of a sudden in the early 12th century when it simply came into being. In time, it would take the name Beelzebub, but until then, it would be alone. A towering mass of twisted human flesh and indistinct features crawling across the textureless sand of the empty, 
on 16 stories of forearm. It spied the opening first. The image of this warm, white circle in the sky drew some emotion from its hulking core, foggy. Beelzebub couldn't quite figure out where it was coming from. What was that? It had only just come into being. Why could it remember the moon? Try as it might, Beelzebub always found that the opening was out of reach. It would watch instead, and as Beelzebub watched, it slowly understood the purpose of this opening and the origin of its own creation. It was simply a remnant of something else, but had no opportunity to become whole once more. In anger, all at once, Beelzebub tore a strip of its own flesh from its body, chewed it for 45 minutes in one of its three mouths, and then spat out something else. Through this process, Beelzebub brought about Belthegor, embellisher of calamity, whom he created in his own ideal image. In a defiant display of anxiety, Belthegor would take only two steps across the vast tilling before he decided that he would go no further without the aid of siblings. The resulting fury that Beelzebub felt forced it to split itself further and further, diminishing its own existence to the point of powerlessness. Over the course of 300 days, Belthegor watched its all-mother birth 205 lives from its own. Beelzebub's children would come to be known as remnants, beings of a natural angst like lonely teenagers, gnawed at by a cosmic trench in their very core, a deep, everlasting vacancy to which their better halves would pay no attention. The birthing process had put Beelzebub out of commission. Barely any of its own flesh remained. It would heal in time, but time was not something that would simply pass the remnants by. So they set out across the empty, as Beelzebub's envoys, in search for something, some momentary warmth besides the ominous glow from the opening above. Belthegor was the first to find a Lynette into humankind's realm. In the midst of all this nothingness, he'd found a hole in the ground no larger than a baseball. He pressed his ear up against it first. Not a sound that Belthegor recognized, and certainly not one you'd expect to be hiding amongst the dirt pressed his face against it, hoping to peer into some sunlit paradise. It was dark in there too. He was correct, and he knew that. Belthegor couldn't see into the stationary plate from here, no. It was very obviously there though, having been so close. When the first sun went to leave, that dullness in his chest never felt so encumbering. It was France on the other end of that tunnel. At least, the Indigo Realities version of France. Scenic France, even. Specifically, an encampment, several days ride from Paris. Less specifically, it was sometime in April 1124, following the decennial grand meeting of the leaders and conquerors known as the Ring. Here slept a weary band of soldiers and King Louis VI. From the warmth of their campfire, the latter's royal aide watched the perimeter alone. Her name was Constance, and she was his go-to know-it-all his strategist, his speechwriter, and a well-rounded fighter to boot. This journey had taken them across their country, and then even further, in order to attend the meeting. Having sparred in debate, as she had on the ground, Constance had earned herself and her country a position in the upper echelon of the ring, from where they would be granted access to an immense, unspendable wealth, covert foreign aid, and other such facilities to help their beloved motherland in ways unimaginable to the uninitiated. Their journey had been arduous, and it had cost them the lives of five good men. So far, it had consisted of 53 days and 54 nights. A proxy king had been put in place to mask their disappearance, and as such, this king would never again sit upon his own throne. The two of them, together, would now rule from the shadows as grand puppet masters, with a directorial board and all. From its inception, this had been the machinations of Constance herself, but she would never see it come to fruition, had her iron will not crossed paths with the indomitable loneliness of remnanthood. Constance, perhaps, would have altered the course of history dramatically. Alas, as Belthegor reached his left hand into the crevice betwixt worlds, something on both sides changed. Physical contact with the stationary plate lasted mere milliseconds, but Belthegor was well aware of what he had done. The atmospheric difference could not sustain a remnant's composition, and eviscerated his fingertips. As it turned out, 
Blindly venturing into the unknown was not the solution that Belthegor was looking for. It did, however, bridge the gap. Unbeknownst to him, the tips of his fingers remained on the other side. Now, being a literal monster of exaggerated proportions, these would resemble large coals to you or me. Almost hollow, entirely weightless, internally comprised of a black honeycomb beehive structure bleeding a gelatinous red sap, it was not a surprise that Constance noticed it on the ground. At first, when she touched it, it was ice cold. She'd picked it up between two fingers and placed it on the palm of her hand. A moment or two passes her by, and the remnant reacts. It burns her with all the heat of the sun itself, melting her very flesh. Her scream wakes the camp, and the king discovers his injured aid, protruding from her palm, a bloody black coal. Now she could hear him, and he could hear her. All of a sudden, a connection had been made, and neither party felt tension or discomfort. Immediately, all that mattered was furthering this connection. This was the natural order of things, and now they both knew it. It could not be. However hard they tried, a fragile, mortal frame could not sustain such an immense, metaphysical presence. His momentary apparition within Constance caused her veins to burn bright red, and permanently exhausted all moisture in her mouth. She did not think of the pain, not in the moment, and not for the rest of her days. Simply, she thought of their unified being, and how all should comprehend the possibility of true completion. The king did not agree, and presumed that Constance's weariness had caused her to become delirious. When her senseless, dry babbling became tiresome, it was apparent to the king that perhaps he'd pushed his aid too far. He could do no more for her, he decided, and exiled Constance from her position and from her home. So she would leave France, and the bitterness would settle. Constance would simply wander, for she could do very little until Balthagor could conduct a secondary experiment. And try as he might, the embellisher of Calamity was unable to recreate his initial success. This process would take some time, far too much time for Constance to wait out, and so as she travelled, she would spread the knowledge of the devil in her palm to all those who would believe her stories. She would forego her original name and amass a quasi-religious following before her death. They would come to call her Nahash, and upon her passing, her followers would cremate her remains and continue to travel with the coal, forever following Belthagor's word. You have been listening to A Stirring in the Empty, an episode of Pulp, Surreal Stories from a Nearby Skull, written and directed by Jake Lucy. This production is copyright 2020 by the Sleepy Bones Detective Agency and is intended for enjoyment purposes only. Any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. If you would like to support the show, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com sbda. Please visit us on the web at sleepybones.agency for more surreal stories.